Hey, everybody, welcome back to the High Performance Zone. Today, I have Sarah, call sign Sound Oster. And she, she is, is not only a meditation teacher and an author, but a sound therapist. And we dive into the five steps to create full body listening. And it starts with pause. In fact, that's the acronym. So I can't wait to, for you to uh, dive into this. Also, what you'll see is we talk about different ways of visualization, different ways to focus, different ways to expand your mind. This applied to business. Sarah has worked for Google. She has worked in the, the New York Times, so many different areas. Uh, and it's all about changing routines into ritual, the mundane to magical. And if you resist, it persists. So this is a very unique one. Dive in and enjoy. Gucci out. Here we go. Glad to be here. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to The Zone. I have today Sarah Oster. Uh, she's a sound teacher, meditation expert, and uh, author. And Sarah, we're going to go deep today. I, I'm so looking forward to it because I need to listen today. I need some of your, your beautiful guidance and, and what you do in the world. So welcome to The High Performance Zone. Glad to have you. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me. I'm no, glad sir. to be here. <laughs> that's, that's good. I I, uh, I know in our pre-call, uh, we were saying that we may have different energies and we're complementary. You know, the uh, Gucci being this high energy and, and you bring people inward. You bring people uh, to be meditative, but also to be centered. Um, how did you get, well, first off, what do you do? What do you do for people? Well, I invite people to slow all the way down, uh, mm. to connect to themselves through a practice of full body listening. Oh. And I do that not only by different types of prompts and guidance with my voice, but also with sounds of instruments that I play as well. Well, I know we're going to have some examples of that uh, later on in the podcast. Uh, you're going to send us some pre-records and we'll pull that in. But when you say full body listening, what does that mean? What does full body listening mean? It means that many of us have an association that we listen just with our ears, that hearing and listening are the same but when we can tune into all of our senses and bring our body and our sensing self on board with listening, we can have a much more powerful, full, transformative experience, whether it's just in conversation yeah. or whether it's how you're engaging with the world around you or even just connecting inward to your own intuition. Yeah. In fact, let's dive into some of those what are those full bodies? Because my wife actually tells me a lot of time that I'm not listening, okay? <laughs> and what she means is not ju just that I'm just talking, but by the way, that, that I do a lot too, right? I'm going to try to listen to you here. Um, but I think what she really means is I'm not feeling her. You know, I can be looking at her, but I'm not feeling her. So give me an example of that. How can I use my body? How can we all use our bodies to actually be better listeners? Well, there's so much that's said uh, behind and between the words yeah. and with, with body language and inflection of when somebody is speaking. And it, it's so much more difficult now for the last year and a half when so many of us have been forced to primarily yeah. communicate in this way when we're just a, a talking head and yeah. all you can see is just maybe some expression of a face if that if you have a good camera and a good connection yeah. but we're not getting a, a, a sense of the of the body language and things like that and so it's even more important that we can fine tune these skills especially in these kinds of situations to sort of read or listen between the lines of what mm -hmm. somebody is saying so just to be really present to kind of sense the emotion behind the words that are that are being said so we can pick up more information. You know, you were, used the word presence. And by the way, most people are, are probably just listening to this. So it's a challenge, right? You and I are on Zoom. We're looking at each other. And like you said, when you, you know, have clients and when you're able to be with people, it's a full body immersion, right? They're getting the sound, the sight, the verbal, the nonverbal communication, all these things come together. Um, and But you use the word presence. Uh, how can you help me and help the people on this call 
just get into a, a better state of presence for even this podcast. So this podcast, I want this to be just really enlightening for as many people as we can. How can you help us get into a state of focused or presence? So I actually have a five-step process. It's an oh, acronym. I, I, I thought you'd really like that. Yeah, let's go. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's pause, P-A-U-S-E. So the, the P in pause is for, is for presence. And the way that you can become present and attuned is by just, just sensing what's happening in the moment, anything. Um, I can say, well, the sun is coming in from my window this way. These are things that you can see, but if somebody is listening, they might not be able to see it. Yeah. Um, just in, in, in what's happening right now. And that takes you into the A of awareness. So being aware of your surroundings, being aware of how you're feeling. I'm a little bit excited to be talking to you. So I feel that energy in my body it's it's what's happening right now um so that's that's helping me to come into that presence and awareness and then you is uh, a universality recognizing that that are present for me are not only for me, but they could be for you too. You might be uh, excited to, to speak to me. Uh, you might be sensing different things in your environment. They might be the same, they might be different, but understanding that we're having some kind of universal experience that mm -hmm. helps us to connect outward. And then S is for silence uh, or stillness. And so giving yourself space, which is another S that kind of fits in there too, giving yourself space to just experience those things. And when you do that one, two, three, four, P-A-U-S, then there's an opportunity for expansion and evolution of, of, of self. And all of that starts by just taking a pause, by slowing down enough to go through those steps to really feel that opening. And I already see, I can just see, for those who are listening, see a shift in your face, just thinking about doing it. And your eyes are softening, your shoulders are dropping, and, and you're already able to experience that. That's not even introducing any, any sound into the equation. Wow. Yeah. I, uh, you know, it, we both have a meditation practice, right? And a lot of people on this, this uh, podcast, uh, we've been teaching focused awareness and meditation is one of those, those cues, right? And so a lot of times taking that pause sometimes is just connecting with your breath, but are there other ways that people can um, use uh, as a trigger? Cause we all know, oh, I need to pause, but, but, what, what are some techniques that you use uh, to pause? Yeah, that's great. And one of the reasons why breath is used so often in meditation is it's because something it's, it's something that most of us have access to at any given moment that we, by, we can notice our breath because it, it's there and it helps us bring, bring us into the, it helps to bring us into the present moment. And similarly, sound can do that. So by bringing awareness through mindful listening to whether it's the person in front of you who's speaking to you or it's environmental sound and noticing your relationship to those sounds, even something that could be as triggering as uh, sirens or traffic or, or things like that. Um, and then just paying attention to your relationship to sound just as you would to your relationship to breath. And so it's just another tool that you can access. Oh, I like that because um, so many times, you know, the, the breath, it's always there for us, but I like the idea of using other techniques, right? And, uh, and sound as being one, uh, also visual cues, right? The idea of looking up to an open sky. You know, I find that I, I like that a lot. I live high in the mountains, right? We're at 6,000 feet. And I just love to look up into the, the open sky or people who are on the ocean, right? The, the, the beauty of looking out into an infinite horizon seems to be beautiful. So that's the sight. Um, what sounds do you typically use for expansion? What, what are those sounds? Are they the, the bowls, the singing bowls, or what, what are some of the techniques that you like? 
So yeah, I use various different instruments, including singing bowls and tuning forks, as well as different types of vocal practices. So ah. instructing people to use their voices as well. Uh, and, and, and typically from the school of meditation that I come from, which is from Vedic philosophy, the mind will move to whatever is the most charming, uh, we like to say, uh, meaning whatever is holy. And it can hold the attention of the mind and take you into that liminal state. So let's talk more about your meditation background and, and how you how you teach. Because again, for this podcast, you know, people are listening are the ones that are probably excited about having the ability to focus. And we know that meditation is a really powerful tool to uh, to use for focus. So give me a give me a background of, of your meditation and and what. Similar to TM, Transcendental Meditation, where it's a silent repetition mm -hmm. of mantra. And in a, in a, in a sense, it is uh, using sound as a tool to bring you into the med meditative state. So even though you're not making audible sound, uh, you're repeating this sound internally to create this yeah. vibration that takes you into the transcendent state. Wow, powerful. I, uh, I like to use mantras myself and, and I, I do usually not say them out loud. You know, I, I say them internally, right? So uh, can you give us a mantra? What is a mantra that you like to use that, that gets you into that high state of awareness or calmness? And by the way, I'm already calmer than on any other podcast I've ever been on. Okay? <laughs> I mean, normally I've got people fired up and we are just going for it, but I like this dynamic. I like this uh, slowing down. Um, so lead me through a mantra real quick, if you would lead us through one. Um, uh, actually one that is very general could be so hum. So as you breathe in, you repeat. So as you breathe out, hum. hum. Yeah. So it's just silent internally. So, so, hum, so, hum. And, and hum, I'm starting to feel it around my chest. Is that where you feel hum? Or I know there's different chakra systems, right? And we can, mm -hmm. different sounds will activate at different areas. Where does that one activate you? Uh, it can it can activate in different places for different people. Um, I'm not necessarily one for prescriptive sound or prescriptive okay. mantra. Um, and so this one is just a simple way to add sounds to the breath, the inhale and, and the exhale. And that's a very basic one to start with. Beautiful. And again, you say we do this internally, right? Even though you were saying so hum and, and ha is it hum or hung? Hum. Hum. Yeah. So yeah. hum. Okay. Yeah. Uh, that, that, nice. What would be... Uh, <laughs> Another one, uh, I like to, uh, I had someone on my podcast recently, we talked about the, the beautiful sound of ah, you know, in the throat and, yeah. and opening up your throat, maybe looking up and saying, ah, this, this mm -hmm. expansion, have, have you used ah at all? Yeah, I use ah a lot actually. And to uh, give you a complimentary practice. In fact, if you lower the, the chin slightly, okay. yes, just to find a little bit of length through the back of the head yes. and the back of the neck, and then find a tone for yourself. And then when, when you you're say ready- find a tone, what do you mean by just, that? Just, just a, a note that you can hold ah out. Okay. Mm -hmm. And Got then it. when you're ready, you can let it out, keeping that lean through the back of the neck. I'll do it with you. Uh, nice. Let's do another one together. Ready? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, 
Nice, nice. You know, it's it's uh, of course the universal one of Ohm, right? Let's talk about Ohm real quick. Why is that such a powerful sound? Uh, well, there are a lot of different elements around the sound Ohm, and and typically pronounced in Sanskrit A U M Aum, uh, because it says. Um, say that again. Um, oh, oh, om, om, om. Om. Yeah, so typically spelt in the transliteration as A-U-M or O-M uh, because it's considered to contain all the sounds of the universe mm. um, in, in, in one because if you say those sounds, which ah symbolizes everything that came before, O, oh, is in the present moment mm, takes you into the future and if you break it down if you break ohm down into those three sections um, um so you could do it with me yeah um, um notice um. how you're not using your tongue at all so these are you think about it like the primary colors of uh -huh. sound um their sound in its natural form because if you make any other um sound uh like any other letters from the alphabet even the sanskrit alphabet you would be using your tongue right and when you say om when you say aum um. you're not using your tongue and your tongue would be like a paintbrush to take those three primary colors or to take that blend of those uh pure sounds to make infinite colors with sound um and so that's another reason why it's said to be a, a very powerful sound because it is the source of all sounds those three sounds together. and you you said past present future right so the ah is the past oh present and um future did i get that right yeah these are various uh interpretations in uh, uh, Vedic philosophy around the sounds, the bija of Om. Yeah. Let's do it together again. I wanna make sure, um, but I'm gonna let you lead, <laughs> okay? Because okay? I, I wanna I want to listen to the way you do it and see if I can feel that in my body. All right, so just for, when we're clear, when you say it fast, it's Om. Om. Like, right, like mm -hmm. O-M. Yep. But when you slow it down to stretch it out. Yep. If you were just like putting it on super slow mo, it would be uh, um. so it starts with an open, right? You feel the movement of the mouth. Um. So then you have this pulsation of the mouth, you start open. Uh, um. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Beautiful. What, um, yeah. what, where did this all come from? Tell me a little bit more about your childhood. I, I, I read something uh, at an age of 10, you were able to connect to your sister in a way that you couldn't connect with because of sound. It, tell, tell me about the story. Where did this deep connection come from with sound? Yeah, uh, actually, Yes, when I was about seven years old, my oldest sister, Jennifer, I have two older sisters, my oldest sister, Jennifer, uh, became ill. And from mm. suffering, coming in and out of comas, uh, she, eventually she became non-communicative uh, by the age of, of 15, 16. And so when we would, we spent a lot of time in the hospital with her as a family, of course, mm. just to be around and, and supportive and, um, hoping that she would heal and make her way uh, through this. And one way that we were really able to communicate with her was through um, singing to her, but also bringing a Walkman with the yeah. cassette tapes of her favorite of her favorite music, and yeah. could just see the, the 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 shift in her eyes and and in her face and. I just, I knew from an early age that music was always not, not only an important tool to access to shift mood and bring my family together, but also as a way to communicate uh, with my sister. Well, you know, the Walkman, it, it's so 
uh, funny you mentioned that. I remember I used to be flying jets off aircraft carriers uh, and I would have the Walkman uh, up underneath all my special, you know, high tech communication equipment. And I'd be circling over the uh, care when I was at sometimes gas to the fighters and you would take turns. But the idea was after you, you did that, it was very peaceful. And I land in the middle of the Indian Ocean, the stars, they, 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 they go right into the water. So if, if you think about this, it's a great meditation. There's no difference between the water and the sky and it's peaceful and it's quiet. Um, and, uh, and I would sometimes pop in my Walkman, uh, but it was the Rolling Stones. So uh, <laughs> I was just going to ask. I have to know what you were listening to. <laughs> the Rolling Stones, Sympathy for the Devil. That was my favorite uh, <laughs> song because I, I, it was always, I hope you're well prepared to die. And uh, that was a way to get me excited about my, my carrier landing that was coming up because uh, you have to prepare yourself. And in some ways, uh, just acknowledging that this was really challenging, you might die was okay. I mean, I'm like, okay, let's go for it. You know, so As you say, you say with a smile. Yeah. For yeah. my, for my sister, it was Chicago and Jackson five, mostly. Those mm. were her two favorites. Chicago. Love it. Yeah. You know, uh, one of the original, um, uh, musicians for Chicago lives in Sun Valley and, uh, yeah, I uh, haven't had a chance to meet him yet, but hopefully. So tell me, as you were doing that with your sister, um, how did you take that into what you're doing now? How did you convert a passion into, and by the way, give our audience a, a little idea. You do these sound therapies, I mean, for massive audiences sometimes, right? Companies, mm -hmm. um, Google, and some of these big names, Madison Garden. You've done, tell me a little bit more about taking you into not only the the body but in healing and illness and i use that as themes in my artwork um throughout my my childhood and was fascinated with uh, the, the, the body and anatomy and how the body recovered from, from illness and injury. And I, mm. I use that in my artwork, not only visually, but in multi-sensory experiences. So I went on to study art and use, uh, mixed media to provide experiences for people to walk into, to listen to, to, to get sense, to, touch and have a full sensory experience. And then when I was working as an artist in that way, I was working in my studio. I was a to do my work on yeah i fell from this oh the floor just collapsed i mean we think yeah. the floor is pretty stable right what happened uh <laughs> the floor broke underneath me and Jeez. i fell 15 feet uh, from the second floor into the first floor with all of my supplies and materials and work and suffered from uh broken back in four places oh. Yeah, and so that is what really set me um, into a deeper inquiry around the body and how it heals itself, because yeah. now I had my own body yeah. to, to investigate. And it was through my journey of healing and exploring different modalities that I came to integrate those practices back into my, into my work. So I began to practice yoga. I began to practice meditation. Uh, and then I just kept going deeper and deeper. I went to school for massage therapy, not to become a massage therapist, but simply mm. to have a better understanding. 
of my my own body and how I could yeah. help other, other people. And so it was a really slow uh, integration of a lot of different things of my experience as a meditation teacher, um, study of psychoacoustics, which is how sound affects the mind, um, back into putting my own aesthetic into the type of experiences that I like to facilitate for people, whether it's in boardroom I'm, I'm in, and that really informs the type of experience I'm able to facilitate for people. Wow, let's dive into some of those because I'm I'm trying to picture myself uh, in one of your experiences. But first off, I, I think that story is right out of a Marvel movie. I mean, floors just don't drop out from somebody. Um, at least I don't. You know, you don't expect that. And so obviously, there are some deep learnings that came out of that um, very uncomfortable broken back experience, right? Um, what have What have you taken back? And then I want to get into the experiences that you do now. What have you taken from that experience where now you look back at it, no one would want anyone to go through something like that, but obviously you learned something, right? What did you learn? Well, I'm sure as, as, as you understand, uh, as many people who are listening understand that it's very often um, the adversity or the most challenging situation that we're faced with that helps to shine light Mm-hmm. on something important in our in our lives and is probably the, the the greatest learning we can receive whether it's um loss of a loved one or uh, a, a traumatic accident or a, an illness um it 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 almost i don't want to say it forces us but it rather invites us to shift our perspective on who we are and how we live uh, it helps us to redirect maybe the direction that we're going in our lives, like, if we're lucky. Yeah. Um, so I, I really see it as a, an opportunity f- for me to, to to redirect, to go deeper um, into my own healing journey, and then ultimately to be able to help other people through theirs. Yeah, I love the way you use the terminology of a challenge or traumatic, something that, you know, is hard in our life, but to shift perspective. Uh, We just did a resiliency training with a healthcare organization that I'm working with. And uh, the third, we were using lots of different examples of resiliency. First is meditation. It turns out, you know, this is scientifically proven, Harvard, smart, all these people. Uh, Meditation is, is a powerful tool. And I like to think now that meditation doesn't mean just you know sitting cross-legged and and being quiet right there's different ways to meditate um through sound like that you're using right or i I like to call it dynamic focus i was meditating in the airplane at a thousand miles per hour closure because i had the ability to focus my mind right and block out distractions and stay completely focused on what i chose to but then also to open up because if you stay to focus down, you, you know, you can, you can miss something. You can hit a sailboat mass or fly in a tree or something, right? So you want to open up and focus down. Um, and as I was thinking about the meditation uh, and the exercise, but the third one was to shift perspectives, to somehow be able to shift the perspective. Now that's easy for us to say, but it's hard to do, especially when you're going through trauma right? When there's something that, um, you know, is, is not pleasant. It's in fact, really painful. What are your advice to people to, in that instance, how can they shift perspective? For, for me anyway, in, in reflecting, I, I think it's, it's different for each person, but for mm-hmm. me, it first was just focusing on getting out of physical pain and what yeah. tools can I access to get out of physical pain. So it's like putting out the biggest fire first or addressing, you know, the, the biggest fire first. Well, I, at that time, I didn't even think or realize that I might have emotional or psychological trauma from the mm. floor falling underneath me. That didn't come until like seven or eight years later. I had to get wow. out of pain. I had to get out of pain first. So really for me, it was like addressing, um, 
the most urgent need, which was yeah. for me the the physical, as to also not get overwhelmed uh, with thinking there's so many different uh, things to address here, but just really kind of fo focusing in on one task and being consistent every day with the things that help you. That sometimes what mm. blocks people from starting a practice of meditation or something like this is that they think that in order to be effective, they have to sit for 20 or 30 minutes in complete silence, cross-legged on a mountaintop with a special robe and necklace or something <laughs> like that. You know, that there are all, could be all these barriers. For right. Entry. You know, when really, if you say, okay, every morning I'm going to set a timer for one minute on my phone and I'm just going to sit, I'm not going to move around, I'm not going to look at my phone, I'm not going to talk, I, I'm just going to sit for one minute and make it really attainable. So setting really attainable, accessible goals, and yeah. then slowly you'll start to see that you like this, that it is effective, that maybe next week we do two minutes and yep. just keep consistent every day. And that's how we turn uh, a routine into a ritual and something that becomes sacred and special to, to who we are and how we're evolving. Oh, I like that routine into ritual. And then you brought in the, the sacredness of that. Um, I like that routine into ritual. Ritual doesn't always have to be um, sacred, let's say, but, but uh, well, you tell me, I, go further on that ritual piece, routine to ritual. Well, I think when, like, like I said, like making, making this kind of mundane thing more uh, mundane to magical almost too. Oh, I like that. Because, yeah, because you don't have to put so much weight or emphasis on having it be special. Yeah. That's where I think people, and when we're just talking about specifically meditation, yeah. you know, having the right cushion and the right lighting and the right candle and, and all right things, you know, to make, and that it's just about being able to carve out the time consistently and then ultimately it, it does become special because it's part of your I want to get into different types of meditation but before we get into that and maybe it's like walking meditation sound there's different types right um I want to get your ideas but before I do that um what is your morning ritual do you have one I'm assuming you do uh, um and if you do what is it I do. And of course, it involves meditation. I typically wake up uh, just before the sun. And my morning practice is about an hour. Uh, so I have a pretty, <laughs> I have a pretty complicated, um, involved uh, Tibetan Buddhist practice. Uh, that involves visualization, open-eyed meditation, and mantra. And then I also have my uh, Veda practice, which is silently repeating mantra. And so the, the first one is about a half hour, and the second one is about a half hour. And so that's my daily morning uh, meditation practice. And then from there, it's always different depending on where I am in the world and uh, what what type of responsibilities I have in showing up and facilitating other people usually involves some kind of movement, um, whether it's a yoga practice or even a walk, sometimes mm -hmm. a swim, depending where I am, just always integrating movement in the morning. Uh, and then that's, that's my morning routine. Okay, so... Uh, if we can, let's unpack a little. I know that a lot of these uh, practices are secret. You don't want to necessarily say, but yeah. what type of visualization um, do you do? Or if, if you can't say that with mantra, um, can you share that first off? Or is it a, a private practice that you, you don't want to share? No, it's fine. And I can certainly share aspects of it, but just Please. so that people know that they, they don't feel like that there's this secret society I, of meditators. But a, a lot of these practices are... Uh, oral 
traditions from lineages that are passed down from teacher to student. Yes. Uh, and so this, this particular practice that I do, um, one might say, uh, or, or my teacher would certainly say that, you know, to be qualified to teach it to, yep. a, to another, you would have to put in, you know, many, many more hours. One part of the practice though, is um, expanded uh, awareness in the open-eyed mm -hmm. Uh, piece and so similar to what you were saying about kind of gazing out into an open field to an ocean uh, in something like this and it's sitting you know with this open awareness with open soft eyes a lot of times open meditation open eyed meditation is done gazing downward and this mm -hmm. this type is with a lifted gaze actually ah yes um, and if you think about like um, peripheral vision, it's almost being able to see everything all at once. And so it's a soft focus in the practice versus staring at a candle or uh, a one pointed focus. It's a many pointed focus. Oh, I love that. I do both. I actually go back and forth. Um, and I was told uh, that we have the human brain has a chance, the ability to do that 65 times a second. So when I snap my finger, mm -hmm. 65 times a second, you have a choice to uh, of, of the inputs that are coming in. So you can yeah. choose to focus down or, or open up, right? And mm -hmm. the idea that you really can't multitask because the human brain can't focus on two things at once, but because we get 65 times a second, we think we can, but we're really choosing uh, to do, like you said, that expansiveness to a single point, expansiveness to, at, at the rate that you choose, right? And obviously, slower is a, is a yeah. beautiful way. What, what, do you, what does that mean yeah. to you when I say that? Well, in, in, in Sanskrit, there's a word spanda, and it actually, it, it, it means pulsation, which is exactly ah. what you're, you're describing, which is not only happening in our awareness, you know, many times a second, uh, but also it's it's a, a feeling and a vibration that's happening in the world all the time. Yes. And if we can engage with that, just understanding that at times we're ex expansive, we're receiving, you know, in a wide space, and sometimes we're kind of contracting and going inward, and that that's always sort of changing, like the breath like the heartbeat that the the world in its entirety is in this continuous spanda pulsation of energy expanding and then contracting yeah i use a lot on my meditation practice i use many different ones but at the end expanding it out through the room through the community through the you know wherever i'm at because i'm in a hundred different places uh, coming back to pause you know with the e i always ends on beautiful. expansive okay, beautiful yeah, yeah but that's why we like the pause again let's see if i can get it without looking down at my notes here so uh pulse the first is to pause right so i mean wait it, it's oh you can cheat okay <laughs> So it is pause is the first one. Um, and then A is awareness. Yeah, I was going to get that. I was presence, gonna that. yeah. Yeah, the presence, the U, university. So we're, we're all in this together kind of idea that, you, you know, it, it, we're, it's the world's coming from us, not at us, right? So mm. we're all part of this together. P-A-U-S. Oh, what was the S? Oh, silence, of course, stillness and space. Just the awareness of, of the magic of an unchanging space right and then mm. what we just talked about that expansiveness wow cool hey um because i want this to, to help me and right now and that is you you started to go through the the steps of first it was physical you had to get took you seven years to you know get through the physical challenges of that trauma that happened to you but then you mentioned the emotional and some of that how did you go about dealing with that Through meditation, <laughs> of, of course, um, and through an awareness that that even existed and w was present in my body, that emotional body, 
And it, it was really through the practice of meditation that I began to shift my relationship with sound. I mean, experiencing some uh, many signs of, of PTSD, uh, like a, a pen or a, a fork could fall on the floor and I would have uh, uh, an emotional sort of outburst, just burst into tears uh, because it felt like such a loud mm. sound. Uh, and so through awareness um, and through meditation, shifting my relationship to sound and loud sounds, especially the sound of things breaking mm. uh, and, and falling. And I, I also think that through my practice, for instance, um, that quite, quite often, if we have something going on emotionally, something that's really up here in the mind or, or emotionally in the heart, that a good way to access that is through the physical body, through moving, through exercise, through things like that. Um, and if you flip it, then if we have an injury or an illness, something going on in the body, maybe we can't be physically active, maybe we need to nurture the physical body, that we can access that through the mind, through doing some emotional work just to help to access different places in the physical body. So they can kind of act as helpful entry points if you're moving through yeah. healing, you know, in different aspects of yourself. What is, when you talk about the, um, the different layers of the body, how do you like to identify them? You know, we, we have the physical, the emotional, you tell me, how do you like to label certain for whole body listening? What, what does that mean? I like to use the term quite often, the, the sensing self, okay. uh, which is more of our, our intuition. Okay. And so being able to connect to that intuitive aspect of our self voice. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there's the intuitive body. Um, there's the physical body, of course, right? Um, there's the emotional body. How is there? Is that different? Is intuitive? Is the emotional body different than the intuitional sensing sensing body? I guess. Yeah, and, and I think in a lot of in a lot of ways, um, all of the bodies are are overlapping. Obviously, yeah. we're one one complete being. Uh, but but quite often, I think the the emotional body could just be really where we're storing emotions mm. uh, in 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 the body. So it can be separate and same as intuitive self or sensing self for me. Okay. So Is there any that. other aspects to this wholeness that you want to share? Um, there's the inner body, right? The channels. So we have inner channels that move energy mm -hmm. flow, but anything else that I'm trying to learn from you. <laughs> yeah. And um, like an energetic body uh, could also come in there. Um, and that would relate to uh, chakras, uh, meridians. If you're talking about traditional Chinese medicine, um, the nadis, if you're coming back to mm -hmm. yoga, all the channels that of energy that run through us. So, and not to get overwhelmed if people are listening and they've never even heard of these things, because it's really about what resonates um, with you, if yeah. anything. Yeah. And that's why sound resonates with you, because you can feel the sound, I think mm -hmm. I, I do. In, diff in my body, right? If I quiet my mind, if I, if I allow it. Mm -hmm. and Even I, if you don't quiet your mind. <laughs> oh, you're still going to feel it. Yeah. Well, of course. Yeah. The yes. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. You know, I noticed on sound, there's some um, sounds you want to actually block out. There's some distractions you try to block out. Uh, at least I do. Um, and there's others that I want to focus in on, but you tell me maybe you can Actually, there's techniques and in fact, of, of both. Way more right? often than not, I would say, invite in those uh, sounds that you're trying to block out. Let them be part of the woven into the fabric of your experience, let's say. Yes. Um, 
because when you attempt to block out anything, especially sound, then you're getting into that, uh, like a contracted state. Ooh, okay. Uh, and a more forceful state. And the idea uh, in, in meditation is to practice without judgment. And so something yeah. that might take us to judgment is saying, you know, this baby is crying or this dog is right. barking and it's ruining my experience. <laughs> just think, think about how that thought feels in, in your, in your right. body, you right. know, that, that sort of, um, right like maybe even ego that you could have any control over what was happening you know in the world and just to just to be with it and just to say okay you know this dog is barking during my podcast and it's it's not ideal but it's what's happening right now uh and that's part of what's happening right now it's and it's actually helping me yes it's helping to draw me more into the, the present moment and present awareness because sound is ephemeral and whatever sound it, you are aware of is happening right now. Wow. Well, I've got my dog here, Ruby. She's a rescue. She's a Rhodesian Ridgeback. She's leaning up against me because the uh, garage door just opened. Her, her mom just came back and she's like leaning up against me going, dad, I, that sound triggered a response, you know, and uh, she can't wait to go see her mom. So that's so cool. Hey, I want to dive into real quick um, some of the experiences that you've uh, been a part of. And so let's, uh, I know that in, in the research, you know, you've done some big events in big places. Um, do you want to share any of those? And then also maybe I definitely want to get into what corporate events you've done, how you bring this to, um, to people. So uh, what are some of the funnest experiences or impactful experiences you've had? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, one of the things that inspired me to take sound experiences to uh, unique spaces and locations is because I saw as I was working one on one with clients and companies and privately with groups, the profound impact that it was having on such a wide range of people. And I wanted the experience to continue to be more and more accessible. So rather than having people come to a secret location, come to the experience, I wanted to bring the experience to the people to where they were. Um, and so one really powerful experience was actually in Oculus in New York City, which if you're listening and you're not familiar, is um, it's a big uh, transportation hub in the financial district in New York City. And it's a, it's a connecting point, kind of like Grand Central or Penn Station, like that for various different trains, but also an indoor shopping mall. And we had about 700 people sitting on the floor, just experiencing wow. this moment of pause, this moment of quiet. And, and there was so much happening all around, but it was as if we created like a force field around us and wow. it's like, like, moths to a flame. I mean, people were just like coming in, they wanted to know, you know, what this was, what was happening. And um, even security guards and police officers came and ah. sat, uh, sat with wow. us. And that was a really, really beautiful and, and powerful experience. Wow. How'd you organize that? Was it? Um, yeah, just did it start with just a small group and expand out? Or did you have a certain group there? Uh, yeah, well, it was an, an open event uh, to the public, and it was uh, an event that I, I used to do in a bunch of different locations with a group of people who had uh, producers and, and organizers who were able to, to, to make it all happen. Yeah. Oh, so that's cool. Give me some other cool, like I, I, I saw here you worked with Google, of course, everyone knows the name, but give me the idea of some of the companies you've worked with and how do companies hire you? What do they bring you in for? Uh, a lot of the time it's for executive and leadership uh, retreats okay. or trainings uh, to either open a day of learning or I often get uh, inserted in, in the middle as a way to um, integrate information that is being presented. Um, I go in to talk about these different practices of listening and ways to integrate it 
um, in the workplace and things Tell like Tell me more this. about that because yeah. I'm very interested in that. How do you actually integrate the learnings? What, what is the technique you use? Uh, so this this idea of of deep listening of listening in a, in, a, in many different ways of using that in practice in 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 meetings in conferences and pitches and all these different ways mm. uh, and and just just helping um, generally helping people to, to to slow down to really let um, a, a solution to a potential problem reveal itself mm. uh, and using using listening and full body listening as a as a technique uh, to, as a tool to help that along and are there with when it comes to nonverbal cues and techniques um, or even verbal ones what are the ones that that you um, you teach people what, what are the ones to uh, be aware of for deep listening? Well, it's really through practice. And it's it's one of the reasons why I want to give you and your listeners a sound yeah. experience, because we could talk about it, you know, all day, all week till the cows yeah. come home. But unless you're experiencing it, uh, you, you won't be able to sense it and feel it for, yeah. for yourself. And so most of the work that I do for companies, for executives, um, is experiential uh, more so than uh, a, a lecture or whiteboarding or going through the tools, but really in order to embody this way of being, uh, you have to be able to experience it. And I do that through the facilitation of sound experiences. Well, we're gonna let everybody listen to one of those. I know we're gonna add it here towards the end. Uh, and before I, 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 we do that, which I'm, I can't wait to do, uh, I, I'd like to take you to just two kind of questions. And one is it starts with the power of mantra, right? You talked about mantras. Are there certain mantras that you can share with the audience? Because I know there's mantras for different things, right? What are some mantras that you can share with the audience that would be helpful to them or that you find helpful to you? I think if you're, I think of the sense of mantra that you might be speaking of, which is more in like a, like an English, uh, like Western affirmation okay. type of type of mantra. Because if you, if you translate the word mantra in Sanskrit, it translates to mind tool a tool for the mind which okay. also could be you know positive thinking or affirmation that applies okay. um and and so i think a mantra ha has to but in that sense in an english sense has to be personal to you and so if there's something um even like glad to be here right <laughs> you know you're just like Okay, I'm glad to be here. I'm glad to be here. If it's if you get a little nervous before a pitch or a podcast or an interview, like I'm glad to be here. I'm glad. And you you just you repeat it, you know, silently to yourself until you really feel glad to be here. And yeah. and that, that's what I think the effect of of repetition of mantra, you know, can have that you really can start to embody the vibration of what whatever it is that resonates for you some people might be like yeah i'm not glad to be here ah, but <laughs> yes of course i'm 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 grateful to be alive or something yes. you know, it's just and it, and it has to you know resonate uh uh for you so i would encourage people to find you know their own personal mantra in that way and then stick with it and see how that reverberation, that repetition begins to really uh, resonate in the body. Well, one I use all the time, and I don't know where it came from, it just came to me, is bless me indeed on the in-breath and bless, bless others through me on the out-breath. So it's just bless me indeed, bless others through me. And uh, that really, no one ever taught me that. It just came to me. I was like, Hmm, that resonates with me. So I like the idea of a personal mantra. Um, is there one that you can share? Yeah, one that's really nice. If you're talking about like connecting to yeah. the breath, inhaling and exhaling, uh, I like a repetition of 
I am here uh, on the inhale and I am safe on the exhale. Mm -hmm. I think a lot of people have a lot of anxiety around meditation, especially beginners. So just repeating, I am here, I am safe, I am here, I am safe. <laughs> I like it. Perfect. I'm going to try that one. I'll do that uh, tomorrow mm -hmm. morning. It's nice. Uh, what is, we mentioned glad to be here and to me, it all revolves around gratitude. And so I want to say thank you. Uh, Sarah's been awesome. I know, by the way, for everyone that's been listening, you've got a, a best-selling book there. What's, what's the uh, title of your book? Um, the book is yeah. called Sound Bath, Meditate, Heal, and Connect Through Listening. I have it here. Oh, let's see. Oh, that's beautiful. And I like the, the art behind you too. Look at the art on that cover. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's an artist, a uh, friend of mine, a painter, Noah Post, and he actually did all the chapter openers wow. uh, for all of the all of the different chapters in the book. So it's it's also, you know, visual yeah. experience as well. Oh, that's and beautiful. At the, at the end of each chapter, there's um a step-by-step -step practice that you can do on your own at home. So, and it's available as an audio book too. To Beautiful. Yeah, show that up again. Sound baths, what's the uh, subtitle again? Meditate, heal, and connect through listening. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. So everybody, please uh, check that out. Also, what's the other ways people can get a hold of you? We'll be putting them in the show notes, but how, oh, do, you like people, how do you like people to get a hold of you? uh instagram it's a great community over there it's just you have a ton see. of followers there don't you how many followers do you have um i about almost forty thousand. Forty thousand. that's awesome which Good job. yeah it's the really really strong community over there and it's been able to uh, be a tool for me to connect with people internationally so that's sarah just at sarah oster s-a-r-a-a-u-s-t-e-r and also that same name.com, sarahoster.com. I'm pretty easy to find <laughs> on the internet, but those are the best ways. I have a monthly uh, subscription. So people can sign up through that on my website. If you want a weekly sound bath, I upload those nice. every week. Yeah. Nice. I'm going to jump into those for sure. I, I know <laughs> sound and visualization helps me a ton. Um, I, I'd like to wrap with by saying just thank you. Um, I'm glad you were here. Uh, Sarah, thanks for sharing your heart, not just your mind and your soul and, uh, and what you do for so many people. Super grateful to have this experience. You gave us some, some really good, powerful uh, um, thoughts here that I'm going to be able to, to go for. But why are you glad to be here? What does glad to be here mean to you right now in this moment? Um, I, I was so glad to be here to connect uh, with you. And I only knew just a little bit about you before meeting you. But um, wow, you just have such a big heart and such open energy. And I feel really lucky that we got to have this time together. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for uh, seeing that. I know that um, you see it not just in your eyes, right? You're, you're listening with your whole body. There's no <laughs> doubt. <laughs> yeah. All right. This has been blessed. I'm so thanks. Uh, hey, everybody, we're going to now give you an experience of uh, Sarah with the sound bath. So thank you, Sarah. Glad to be here. Thank you.